I will be talking about AI for imaging specifically because this is the research I am doing and everything I will be telling you about is work coming from UT Austin uh, where we have an amazing new institute that's called the Institute for the Foundations of Machine Learning. Uh, and uh, I want to give credit to all the students who did uh, all the work here and also my collaborators uh, from UT. And we also have ongoing related projects with Spark that I will very briefly talk about. So very quickly, the first thing, where is AI research going? Uh, the first thing that you will learn if you take my machine learning class is that what's called supervised learning, it works very well. What is supervised learning? If you have a bunch of uh, labeled data, so you have a bunch of features and a bunch of labels, in my class, you do import scikit-learn, import XGBoost, model.fit, model.predict, and it works really well, okay? So if you're basically trying to uh, predict uh, label data, right now we have had amazing progress in the last 10 years. This is fueling most of the industry breakthroughs, and it's great, but there's a lot of problems with it. The first problem is that these, method, these models work well in distribution, but they're very fragile every time something changes. Something may change because you change your sensor. Something may change because somebody's manipulating your data. This is called adversarial examples. There's a lot of uh, research going on in this space. So the moment something changes, something you may know or not even know about, you have to be more careful. Uh, and sometimes, that's another interesting thing, is that sometimes it works for completely wrong reasons. For example, it may be detecting that there is an animal, like a camel, uh, and it's just detecting it by detecting sand, because every time there is a sand in the training set, it's always a camel, right? So, so it could, in your test set, it, you, you may think it's great, but then when you try it to detect camels um, in a city, it will fail miserably. But what uh, we are doing in uh, UT that I will tell you about is what I think is the future is how, how do you deal with unlabeled data, okay? So you may have a lot of data, a lot of images, for example, but you don't have a lot of labeled data. Uh, so one answer is what's called generative models. These are neural networks that I will explain a little bit about, uh, that are networks that are, have imagination. They're able to imagine fictional data. And then I will tell you how if you can build a generative model, you can solve this big family of problems that are called generative models. Uh, sorry, that are called inverse problems, including denoising, tomography, super resolution, and many others. I will explain what these mean. Uh, or there's another big uh, thread right now in uh, AI research on what's called self-supervision or creating your own labels from your data and training your models with those. I will not talk that much about that, but that's also a big thread in AI research right now. So the first type of network, these are called classifiers. The input is an image, the output are labels. So right now, you can train models, you put in any image you want, it will recognize it at human or even superhuman performance, okay? So this is the good old uh, supervised stuff. The stuff I'm talking about today is networks that have a few inputs, like 100 numbers that I'm calling here Z. You put in these 100 inputs and it will generate an image. It will dream of an image. And you can see it kind of looks like some, somewhat like a face in the beginning. But as you're training these weights internally, it becomes better and better. And after a while, it produces a face like this one, which looks pretty realistic. And I want to emphasize that this is not a real person. This is just a dream of a generator when I put in 100 knobs here in some random positions, okay? So very few uh, people and very few companies are able to train generators. Unlike your good old classifier where anybody can train it with two weeks of machine learning research, training generators needs PhDs and, and experienced researchers. Uh, and there's a lot of those. You may have heard of GANs or VAEs or score-based generators. There's a whole family of those things, but they're all basically imagining data. And here's an example of the latest. This came out like two years ago. This, this website is called This Person Does Not Exist. You can go to that website. Every time you refresh, you will see a person. That person does not exist. It's a dream of a generator. Of a generator. And it looks near perfect. I don't know if you would be able to tell if this is a fake person. And then people have also trained generative models on maps. This map does not exist. Okay, that's so, it's starting to sound a little stupid, uh, but I will, <laughs> I will try to convince you that's actually incredibly useful. But let's stay with stupid for now. Uh, there's another website that's called this chemical bond does not exist, where you can train neural networks that are imagining chemical bonds that do nothing, which sounds, again, really stupid. Uh, 
So this was my question a few years back. Okay, we can build these neural networks that are imagining things that look real. They have the statistics of the real stuff, right? But it doesn't do anything useful. So can we do something useful with them? And the silly answer is you can generate fake pictures and make fake uh, LinkedIn accounts and, and spam people. People are doing that, right? That's indeed a use case. It's kind of stupid. That's not why we're here. What I'm trying to convince you is to go from this silliness to my main message that if you can train a generative model, that's an incredibly powerful thing for your problem. I will argue it's a modular differentiable prior that knows the statistics of your data and you can use it to, to, to do a million useful things, not just generate fictional data. That's the main point. Uh, for example, you can denoise real data. You can fill in missing data. You can do compression. You can compress your data. You can do super resolution. If you have a noisy or blurry image, you can uh, increase the resolution. And uh, there are products right now shipping in the Android imaging. Uh, there's a super resolution pipeline that, that's already used. Uh, that you can do colorization. You must have seen this already, where you have an old photograph. It's black and white, but you want to add colors. So this is like missing data. So again, you can use a generative model to do that. Uh, you can do compressed sensing, which is a tomography problem, and all kinds of other tomographic problems like uh, accelerating magnetic resonance imaging or seismic imaging that we're working at Spark with. All these things you can do if you could only train this network to imagine data. I will show you how. Uh, you can go from just imagination to useful things. And then I will show you some uh, examples. Oh, by the way, also you can do anomaly detection because if you're network knows how real faces look like, you can also ask it, does that thing look like a real face or does that thing look like a real trace? And that's why it's useful. So let's start with results. Everything I'll show you are results from our lab. This is a picture of my friend Vijay who invited me to give a talk uh, uh, two years back. Well, I downloaded his picture from the web and you can see that I removed a bunch of pixels. So this is a missing data problem. You're missing all these pixels and, and it's called in-painting. I would like to ask my generator not to dream of some random face, but to dream of a face that looks like VJ. So we have an algorithm to do that, okay? So once we run our algorithm, we got this image. This is using our 2017 algorithm that's called CSGN. And if you look at this image and you start with this, um, you, you see that's pretty amazing, right? Because it's, it's actually produced somebody who has two eyes and has a mouth so it knows all the statistics of humans. It's, a, it's incredible. Like you, wouldn't, you wouldn't be able to think that you would be able to do something like this. And then if you look more carefully, you realize that that's actually a white guy. <laughs> and, and, and Vijay is not. So that's also a little bit of a problem, right? So there are some good news and some bad news here. Uh, so the next thing we said is, okay, it's working, but there's all these biases that we need to be very careful about. How do we fix them? So the answer is we came up with a new algorithm where we go inside the generator, inside the brain, the intermediate layers, and you mess around with them. You don't just mess with the input knobs, you mess with the internals. And as you're optimizing the intermediate layers, this is optimizing layers one and two, we got this a little better. And then optimizing layers one through four, we get this 2021 algorithm, which is producing this image. This is pretty good. Uh, it, if you know VJ and I show you this image, you totally say that's VJ. There are still some artifacts. But if somebody gave us a better generator, this would do better. The main point is NVIDIA trained the generator, spent millions of dollars training this GAN. I'm not retraining it. I'm just using it as a foundation model. And I'm just changing its, its internal knobs to match my observations to fill in missing data. Okay? And that's the power of deep learning is that you're leveraging pre-trained models. I don't even have the data that uh, NVIDIA or OpenAI may use. I don't need them. I just download the model and mess around with its knobs, right? So um, let's quickly talk about how you do this. So you take my picture and you have this. This is the generator here. It's a machine. It's a function in Python where you put in 100 numbers, it spits out an image. So if you put 100 random numbers, it's going to spit out some random face. But I want to produce the numbers that may match my face. The way you do that in deep learning, sorry for the math, there's math, uh, you write down a function that is the distance of the generated image minus my face. And you say, let's search for z that minimizes this function. 
Because this is a differentiable function end to end, because of this magic that's called back propagation that you can propagate through this whole box, you are updating z, the latent vector, to match the generated dream to match my image. And you get this guy. And that guy kind of looks like me, maybe a little older, maybe a little sad, doesn't exist, right? Uh, but, but, but you know, you see, it's, it's okay. It's going somewhere, but we need to uh, update the internals to do better. But we're getting somewhere. Uh, then, so this is the main message here. It says here, we are changing the input so that the dreamed image matches the measurements. That's the punchline. That's how you'd use a generator to do useful stuff, okay? Now, how do you do in painting? Well, you, you generate an image that agrees not on the missing data, but only on the boundary, right? That corresponds to writing a different function. You can write down the math. That's a differentiable function. You do gradient descent in Z space, and you update the Z, so you produce, you get this person. And this image, again, is kind of matching this one. For example, the mouth is not perfect, but if somebody tomorrow gives me a better generator, I will be able to plug and play and do better. If I wanted to do this for MRI or for seismic imaging, which I do, I have to train generators for these domains. And I am, but that's the hard part. Right? So uh, another example is super resolution, deep blurring. Uh, have you heard this enhance? They say in the movies, enhance, enhance to catch the suspect, right? So, so you're searching for a latent vector Z so that the image, you're not searching for a Z that, the, that produces a blurry person. You're searching for a Z that produces a person so that after they are blurred, match with the blurred observations, right? Again, you write the math, you do gradient descent, and you get this, this image, which is pretty good. You probably shouldn't go arresting anybody uh, with this uh, because it has a lot of biases, but as you, as you see, uh, but uh, it's, uh, it's definitely a very state-of-the-art uh, super-resolution algorithm that, that uh, was published. So this is the general idea, and you do gradient descent in the latent space to satisfy the measurements, and you can only do this because everything is differentiable. So this is a paradigm of what's called differentiable computing that's using pre-trained models as black boxes. There's also other work. I have a survey if you're interested uh, for more details on this, but there's many other parallel efforts on this. Uh, there's a problem again. Uh, if you, so this is from a tweet I made, probably my most successful tweet. I said, we use the deep learning algorithm for your MRI reconstruction, but unfortunately it was trained on, on uh, cats on the internet. So it imagine the cat on your kidney, right? <laughs> and, and this is uh, funny, but if it was a different type of tumor, it maybe wouldn't be as funny, right? So, so you definitely want to make sure that if you're generating, if you're making a generative model for MRI, it has seen all tumors it could po that could possibly exist. Or it's flexible enough so that it can reconstruct something that's clinically meaningful, not misguiding. So if it, if it produces, uh, if it has biases, those could be clinically a huge problem. Uh, so going back, so you can see the bias here that this produced this person. If we optimize in the internal layers of the network using our new algorithm, we get this image. Uh, and this image is not actually me. It is the dream of this uh, style gun 2 with internal layer optimized. I'm showing it in the big one here. I don't know if you can see that it's not me. It has, the background is blurred out. It has a few artifacts, but it really looks like me. In fact, I don't know if I would have the the rights, the digital rights, to use this image if this... Right, there's also legal issues here. Like, is this the original image or is this not an original? So there's all kinds of interesting problems. But right now, with optimizing, you can do that. Uh, if you go too deeply in the network, you, you get this kind of images. If you, if you go too deeply, the network becomes too powerful, too flexible, and it can produce not only realistic faces, but Picasso type of distortions that you can see here that are fun for art, of course. But the deeper you go, the more expressive your network is, which is both a good thing and a bad thing, right? It's a good thing because it can produce more images. It's a bad thing because you need more measurements to reconstruct something. That's a patch. So here is examples. Uh, these, are, these, are, these are real people. This is a real person, Stefano, who's a professor at Stanford. We observe this image. We reconstructed this. And the previous state-of-the-art algorithm reconstructed this. This is a great face, but it's not Stefano, right? So you can see the biases the algorithm has, whereas if you saw this image, I would argue you would recognize it as Stefano. And then another experiment we did, these are 2021 results, is from this dust of pixels here, this is 1%, we are able to reconstruct this image 
for this person, whereas the previous algorithm produces this. When my students gave this, from 1% of the pixels, I said, you guys have a bug. There's no chance in, in Earth you're reconstructing the face from this dust of pixels. But right now, uh, we are able to reconstruct images from extremely undersampled, in the extremely undersampled regime. So that is very, very interesting and surprising. Uh, we can also do denoising, and I'm, am I running out of time? Oh, not so much. We can also do super resolution. You are observing blurry images. Uh, this is the ground truth. You probably know these folks, right? So this is, the, this is Sparta fellow. You've seen this documentary about 300. Yeah, so, <laughs> so Samuel Jackson and Barack Obama, these are ground truth. Uh, there, is, uh, there is now the blurry images. The neural network observes these three images. Our algorithm reconstructs this column. The previous state of the art reconstructs this column. You can see this guy is famous uh, because he's called White Obama. So if you search <laughs> White Obama, uh, th there was a fiasco on Twitter because people posted this algorithm and it was reproducing uh, this white person. So this is called White Obama. So you can see that the, al the previous state of the art algorithm is producing these biases. Uh, whereas optimizing inside the network or doing a better algorithm is allowing you to remove those biases to the best of our understanding, right? Uh, so just quickly on the bias issue, and I have time, uh, somebody uploaded on Twitter the tool. It said, upload this little 16 by 16 pixel image and we are going to create a super resolution, 1,000 pixel by 1,000 pixel image for you, here, for free, amazing, right? And then somebody went on the tool online and uploaded the image and, and out came, this is the first Twitter post of the famous Wad Obama uh, story. And then everybody was going there and uploading images and it was basically making everybody white, okay? <laughs> and and, and that, that, that got a lot of, uh, that obviously was a huge problem. It also created a conversation. Is the problem because the generator has only seen white people in the training set, right? So is it a data set problem or an algorithms problem? That, so that became a big discussion. Uh, I will answer this question. We have a result uh, in this paper that, that was just published in 2021. Our answer is that, yes, there is bias in the data set, but there's also a bias amplification because of the algorithm, okay? The reconstruction algorithm that we're using can be seen as MAP, maxima posteriori, or maximum likelihood inference. And I will give you a simple mathematical argument why MAP will amplify any bias that is in the data set. Uh, these are our results, just quickly. On the top row, you see real people. On the uh, second row, you see the measurements. On the third row, you see the previous state of the art. It's terrible, okay? It's terrible. It's doing, well, everything it's doing is terrible. You can see in all these examples, it's terrible in unique ways in each row. But it's failing miserably, and you can see all its biases. So it's not that this is a cherry picking thing. It was actually failing. Uh, so, Whereas with, uh, with correct uh, algorithmic innovation here, sampling from the posterior, we were able to fix that problem to the best of our uh, knowledge. But there's still ongoing research on this, uh, of course. Uh, intuitively, just to quickly explain my mathematical point, is this a training uh, problem or an algorithm problem? And we say it's both. Why? Because maxima posterior inference is amplifying bias. Let me explain this with a simple example. I have a coin and it comes heads 60% of the time. I flip it 10 times, okay? And I'm looking at the sequence here. Heads, tails, heads, 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 okay. You expect 60% heads, okay? If I ask you to guess a single sequence to win this game with maximum probability, what is the sequence you will guess? It will, is the question making sense? You have to play a sequence. What sequence do you play? If you know probability, you will play uh, all heads, okay? So you, this is the sequence that maximizes the probability, but if you were sampling from the distribution, sampling from the posterior, you are going to produce a guess that has 60% heads. So the previous algorithms are basically doing maximum likelihood, maximum likelihood, even if there's a tiny bias in the data set, it's going to be amplified, okay? By construction, because the algorithm is obsessed to find the right answer. And the right answer, even if you have 51% white people, is to always reconstruct white people, right? So that's, that's the problem of the algorithm. So instead of doing maximum likelihood, we propose to sample from the posterior, which is an algorithm that will actually balance to some extent the problems. Still, you need a balanced data set, but at least it's not gonna be that bad. Okay, 
very quickly, you can also turn your friends into frogs. How do you do that? This is uh, funny, but there is a useful component to the funniness. I have a generator, it dreams of faces. I have a classifier that knows frogs. You can train a classifier that you showed an image and it tells you the frogness of the image, okay? You can train that, you can download the pre-trained one. So you write down a loss that says, produce an image that looks like uh, my friend, but also has high frogness. So I'm basically using two networks st stuck one after the other and using gradient descent to propagate through the two networks and optimize the image I'm getting. The main serious point about this is you can leverage a pre-trained generator and a pre-trained classifier to do whatever you want, sticking these things like Legos to do whatever you want. For example here, as I'm changing the frogness, you get a Stefano, and then initially it starts becoming more and more like a frog. So here's a movie of that for your entertainment. You see it searching the latent space. Initially, it matches uh, Stefano's characteristics, and then the classifier starts saying, now I need to increase the frogness of the image. So you see how it's adding, making it green and trying to make the classifier uh, say that's an image of a frog, but also it's an image that looks like Stefano. And if you gave me another neural network that was saying good lookingness, I could make, it, I could make Stefano a good looking frog, right? <laughs> so if you give me more networks, I can just play around with them. Everything is differentiable. And that's the whole magic of deep learning, right? So the modularity is the point, the serious point in this. So I wrote in, on Twitter, one huge advantage of deep learning is modularity. You can download pre-trained models, glue them like Legos, and fine-tune end-to-end because gradients flow through the whole thing. Somebody said, who glues Legos, right? And, so it's fine. You, you glue Legos if, you're, if you are uh, fine-tuning them. Now you can no longer break them apart. But the serious point is you don't even have to have the data to do this, right? You can just download these pre-trained models and do your own job, just fine-tuning on a little bit of data. And that is a new paradigm of programming, essentially, that I think is going to be very impactful as opposed to training an XGBoost. If you have an XGBoost, you cannot backprop through the thing. Uh, many uh, famous people disagreed with me, uh, so uh, that's, I'll leave that, you can read it, but I still think that I'm right, but uh, you know, we can have a conversation on that uh, offline. Uh, so, we are also applying these techniques for MRI. So we want to accelerate MRI, right? Uh, if you could do 4x or 12x faster MRI, you could scan four times or 10 times more people, reducing the, the cost of the scan, which is basically the utilization of the machine. You can also scan babies, because babies cannot stay in the scanner without moving for 10 or 15 minutes. So we, are, we trained the first deep generative model for MRI images. Uh, and we used a, a public large data set for that, uh, and it took us months. Uh, and we, made, we were able to match the state-of-the-art performance of deep learning supervised methods in distribution. But more importantly, we are robust to changes in scalar calibration or anatomy changes. So we were able to train a generative model on brains and use it to reconstruct MRI images of knees. Okay? So our model is not, it's not that it's the best model in the world, end-to-end -end models, where you just train a black box to go from measurements to images, are just as good. But they have no trust, they offer no trust, they offer no separation between the physics of the acquisition process and the uh, uh, physics of the anatomy that you're trying to learn. They have learned both the anatomy and the measurement in the same neural network, whereas we have separated the two things. Uh, so this is uh, some examples of our results uh, from NeurIPS 2021. You can see that we are, this, our results are in this column, and you, you can see we are producing uh, better images at uh, 6x acceleration and 12x acceleration uh, compared to very competitive uh, methods that are used uh, in cutting edge research right now. Uh, and we are working on similar techniques on seismic imaging uh, in Spark in our research team there. Uh, and last thing, we can detect objects, not just reconstruct images. Can anybody guess what this top image is or what the middle image is or what the bottom image is? So both of those are super highly corrupted images. So we trained a model that looks at these types of corruptions and can tell you what these images are uh, without actually reconstructing, without trying to reconstruct, just trying to get the labels. 
So these are the real images, and this is what our model says. The first one is a carbonara, the second one is a Doberman, and the third one is a rock crab. So right now, we can actually classify all kinds of images from extremely corrupt or missing data situations. So that's a very interesting research direction. Uh, and the other one that we have, and this is kind of my last slide, is given a bunch of hours of low resolution video, uh, we're interested in the problem of free text search, okay? So you can train, of course, a truck classifier that looks at images and tells you if it's a truck or not. But can you train a classifier that looks for a truck with Odvala written on it? You see, you cannot train a model with such a very specific text label because you need a data set of trucks with Odvala written on it versus not that, right? And at query time, you don't want to afford to train a model. So using a contrastive learning technique that's called CLIP, uh, you can actually now do free text search in images and in video. So you can type your own, like I tried uh, Greek baklava versus Persian baklava. You may know there's a big uh, debate about what baklava is better. Uh, it's the Greek one. Uh, but <laughs> <laughs> but my mo the model was actually able to distinguish uh, Persian baklava from Greek baklava, with, with which it's, it's shocking that Clip can do that. So we think it's a very interesting direction that can have a lot of applications. So wrapping up, generative models are neural networks that can imagine things. And beyond making fake LinkedIn profiles, I hope I can convince you that's a useful thing. They can be used as priors for all kinds of inverse problems. And they can be combined with pre-trained classifiers to guide generation, like our frog example. Uh, applications include medical imaging, computational photography, object recognition, noise imaging, free text video search, and seismic imaging. These are the things that we're working on in UT, but probably there are others. Uh, the future of AI will be unsupervised in general. This is something I believe because everybody has a lot of data, but not many people have a lot of label data. So I will stop here and thank you very much.